Adam Shaw, and for 20 years I've been reporting on the world of business and finance. 17 of them have been spent here at the BBC. Well, I'm leaving the studios today to look at the world of education, to see whether schools should be run like a business. What's the most effective way they can spend their budget and use their money? Well, I'll be visiting three schools. The Capital City Academy, the first academy to open in London, where it's considered good business to have a professional basketball team based on site. <laughs> Tidemill Primary in South London, where it's practically compulsory for parents to attend school. And Preston Manor Secondary in Wembley, where it's possible to turn location into extra income. Each of these schools has achieved remarkable success. I want to know what accounts for that success. Is it because the schools are run like businesses? I'm about to find out, and I'm about to have one of my preconceptions shattered. I start my investigation at the Capital City Academy, London's top performing academy, which opened its doors in 2003. Since then, GCSE A to C passes have increased to 53%, a six-fold increase compared with the predecessor school, Wilston High. The architecture here reminds me more of a corporate headquarters than a school. And do you feel that the pupils react differently because of the environment? There's no question that the older students in particular, the ones who are in the old school, felt tremendously proud of being given this building an opportunity. And we've tried to preserve that ethos with the younger ones as they've come in since. The building probably is, is an adult building, so perhaps it's of more immediate appeal to older young people. Talking about how the outside looked, like this was a business, do you think that's a fair parallel to draw between schools and industry? Yes and no. I mean, the first thing we've had to do is pay attention to the basics of schooling, attendance, punctuality, behaviour, good teaching and learning. But then we've got to make sure we do that in a business-like way. And that means drawing on what business knows about paying attention to the people, the, your staff, the, your customers or clients, the students, your processes, the teaching, and your money, the resources, how you marshal those to support the other three. The difference is the return on our investment is the achievement and self-esteem, good adult future of our students. I think the idea that perhaps I grew up with in the 60s and the 70s, that schools were unique and that we were unlike any profit-making organisation, are wrong. If students are the customers here, then the education is certainly customised. As a school specialising in sport and the arts, it encourages those with particular talents. 13-year-old Rukaya is a good example. She's taken off timetable to spend more time on the table tennis table. Uh, playing against middle-aged men in suits, however, is not normally part of the training. Do you find that it interrupts your education? Uh, not really. We're able to catch up with work. We get help catching up with work. And we're never taken out of core curriculum subjects. Do you find that it makes you think differently, then, ab about, about your lessons? Um, yeah, it helps us, me focus and it makes me more organised. Would you call that a net profit? Perhaps not. Speed it up now, speed it up, speed it up, speed it up. I retreat to the drama studio and wonder whether it really can be efficient and cost-effective to let students off the timetable. Struck me from an organisational point of view, it must be a nightmare. Um, yes and no, I mean, they, they have to catch up, they catch up, you know, we, we do after-school clubs, so they have to catch up in, right. the, in those times, so um, it, it could, I mean, in drama, maybe in, when we're doing um, group work, it can affect right. the learning, but they catch up, they do catch up. As well as being taken off timetable, students can be detached from their year groups if they excel in a particular subject, especially IT. The school has joined the Microsoft IT Academy. Most of the pupils in this Year 9 class will gain the equivalent of a GCSE by the end of this year. From a business perspective, this is incredibly efficient, isn't it? Because you've got everyone working by themselves on, on computers and the computers are taking them through exactly. the class and you're just there as a moderator. So I am just as a, here as a facilitator. If they need help, yes, I am here. But they normally um, go through every single module very independently. The flexibility extended to students is also given to staff in the way they teach and what they teach 
I was surprised to find an English class where the lesson had been given over to the pupils. The teacher here is a survivor of the former high school. We make sure that they're learning in a much more interesting way. And I think that drive, you know, that desire for us to want the students to do well has been here. Even at our predecessor school, I was here at Wilson High, that drive has always been there. Right, so that's not I about think... the structure of the school in your, in your well, view. What I think is the drive has always been there, but what the school has done is actually allowed us to make sure that those things can be in place. And so we then give the students the opportunity to make sure their dreams and ambitions are actually realised. Lunchtime gives me the opportunity to try some teaching in the Circus Skills Club. Throw, 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 throw. Okay, that's right. Throw, throw. Throw, throw. I think I'll stick to the day job. That's it. Right, now try it with the third. I'm an amateur teacher only. Yeah, so you're thinking of the square and hitting to the two diagonals? Uh, Is that, that was, how you explain th it? No, but that's no. so much better. I was going <laughs> the old method of throw, throw, keep throwing and throw more. Lunchtime supervision is placed in the hands of a number of appointed students and they get more out of it than the chance to just sample responsibility. They get paid £5 a day, which means they don't have the distraction of after-school jobs. Payment to staff and students takes about 80% of the Academy's £7 million budget, which is typical of most secondary schools. You can choose to have fewer, more expensive staff or more cheaper staff, and getting the balance of that right, going to make sure you've got experienced, qualified teachers in key roles, but where you can create non-teaching roles to take some of the work, behaviour management work or whatever, away from teachers, that's significant and that's a growing development in most schools. So even though you may only be able to play with 3 or 4% of the budget, that you feel could make a big difference? Well, yes, absolutely. And I think making sure you've got more to play with rather than less by being very careful to restrain your staffing costs is critical in schools. Again, schools in a muddle typically have let staff costs run away with them. You've mentioned this a couple of times now about trying to keep teachers' costs low, but surely that is what a school is about. You, you told me that earlier, that this school isn't about the building, it's about the teachers. So you shouldn't be cutting teachers' costs, you should well, be not, Because if you have there. got those teachers not delivering fully because their classes are too small or you've used teachers to do work that other people could do, that's a very expensive way of not hitting the spot. I'm impressed with the capital City Academy. The principal clearly sees this as the massive business it is. He makes a priority of human resources, more and better staff, but as he just told me, he recognises that balancing the books is as big a priority. As Leeds United demonstrated, attempting to buy success by overspending is a dangerous business. However, I think it's a truism that businesses improve their profits by keeping their structures simple. That's clearly not happening here with so much emphasis on individualisation. They're almost going out of their way to make things complicated. If this was a business, you'd come and go simplify, make everything simple. And you're not doing that, you're doing the reverse of that. Well, not really. I mean, Marks and Spencer's got into trouble by losing touch with its customers, didn't it? If we don't engage our children, we won't achieve anything. I also believe that businesses should stick to what they're good at. So, if the Academy is in the business of education, what's this got to do with it? A professional basketball team based on sight. The London Capital team, as they're called, play in the English National League. Now they're professional, but they're not full-time basketball players. That's the point, isn't it? No, they're not full-time. Right. So, during their other bit, they're doing what? Well, during the other bit, they're, they're here employed as teaching assistants within the, within the school. Um, as professional basketball players, they carry a huge power with young people, so they're seen as celebrities right. um, within the classroom and positive role models. One of the team's star players is Liger Perkins, who's played in professional leagues in Europe and the States. I deal with the kids in the English department, and some guys deal with the kids in the math department. Some do um, physical education right. and do coaching in, in the gym. But um, we, we specifically try and, you know, get the kids to open up to us a little bit. Um, I try and ask the kids what they would like to do after school and try and get them to realise that, you know, school is short and life is long. I also believe that I should stick to what I'm good at and whatever that might be, it's not basketball. Ah. Oh. How many hours have we got? Oh. Oh. Oh.
At Tide Mill Primary, the depressing exterior belies the brilliant results that have been achieved inside. Of the 330 pupils, more than a quarter are refugees. Two-thirds speak English as an additional language and half qualify for free school meals. Despite these added challenges, it's been in the top 5% of most improved schools for five years. After facing closure, the school is now oversubscribed and is soon moving into a new building on a new site. As I arrive, I come across one reason for the turnaround, embodied in Lisa, the family liaison officer. Every child and every parent is made to feel welcome from the very start of the day. Lisa knows every one of the pupils and can tell which ones are missing. Why do this? To make sure that our ten... I mean, as a, as a present figure, parents know that they report to me in case of absence and that I'll be on the phone to them if their children are late right. or not in. So, and also to work with families and just to, for families to see me as being very approachable, hence I'm out here every morning. Parents are actively encouraged to become part of the school. There are regular activities for them, such as these preparations for the Chinese New Year. There are also parental workshops once a term when forthcoming classwork is explained and projects set to carry out with their children. Non-attendance results in phone calls, letters and even being named and shamed in the school newsletter. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much indeed for coming to uh, our Inspire workshop. For those of you who know a parent who hasn't turned up this morning, can you remind them that it really is the Tide Mill way? We expect parents, as you know and as you have recognised today, we expect... We demand parents are involved in school activities. The school also organises and funds after-school lessons for parents, including English and IT. From a simple business point of view, this seems like an exercise in diverting resources away from the core business of educating children. Well done, guys! But this class makes perfect business sense. It's a valuable lesson in movement and expression, it's greatly enjoyed by children of all years and... It's free. The Laban Conservatoire of Music and Dance, which is based nearby, come into the school every week, but don't charge because it's part of their community work. Tide Mill does, however, pay for outside coaches and supervisors to oversee games at break and lunch times. All activities are organised, which reduces the opportunities for unruly behaviour and the time teachers need to spend sorting it out. Having had top coaching myself, I can, of course, help out with the basketball. It's a games policy that must be working because Tide Mill triumphed at the Millennium Stadium in 2005 when the boys won the National Under-11 School Championship. At Tide Mill, there's a three-form entry for each year, but every morning, pupils are split into four groups. First, they're in streamed classes for numeracy and then in mixed ability classes for literacy. More complication. Usually you'd have one teacher and that would you'd take the class You would day. Day. Okay. That's not how it works here. Yeah. It's not. How do you find that? Um, it's been an adjustment. I've just, this is my first year at the school. Um, and when I came, I wasn't quite sure how it worked, but I've actually really enjoyed it. And I wonder how much the, the child composition changes when you're in this group. It does. I mean, my, mine um, changes quite a bit. I take, take a numeracy set which has ten children in the morning, so I have ten for numeracy. And then this group, most of these year threes belong to me. Right. Um, I've got about six that come from Mr. Clark's <coughs> class. Um, so, you know, they do move around quite a bit, but it sort of it works well in terms of the quality of work they're producing. There's also intensive teaching for children who are still learning the language, including one-to-one -one sessions. This girl has recently arrived in the area from Brazil. The extra classes, of course, mean extra teachers, extra assistants and extra expense, although the school has two deputy heads who each spend the morning in the classroom. As well as the two deputies, there's also a part-time assistant head whose duties include tracking the progress of all pupils. But the management doesn't end there because there's also a business manager. Tide Mill attempts to attract and retain the best staff, which of course means offering more money or additional professional development. The teaching assistants are also more expensive because they're almost all higher level TAs but it means they can take over their class one afternoon a week while the teachers from each year group meet and plan. 
Should we have that over there and link it with um, ZT? Mm -hmm. yeah, toys. Toys, toys, Mason yeah. Toys, yeah. Do you think that its general approach in the way that, that it uh, goes about its, its everyday business is better than other schools you've taught at? Um, well, for me, that's quite a difficult question because I've been at this school for nearly Forever. 20 years <laughs> All right. and I've seen an awful right. lot of changes. Well, I was going to say, in yeah. fact, it's not because yeah. the school hasn't had that approach for 20 yeah. years, so in fact, it's not a difficult question for you at all. It's a perfect question for you because you've seen yeah. the same school yeah. under a number of different regimes. Yeah. Well, which is the best then? It has changed an awful lot. I think there, um, there are a lot of elements now that are far, far better. Certainly, I mean, it's only the last, about the last three years that I've had been given any time to do any planning. Right. And before you were having to do it at the weekends? Always, always. Past midnight yeah. or whatever. Always, always. Every night and at the weekends. Now, as I've made clear, I believe businesses need to keep it simple as well as cost effective. But what we've got here is a school acting like a social club or a night school for parents. In the classroom, there's an intricate strategy of swapping pupils around for literacy and numeracy, and on top of that, it's paying for more managers and offering extra money to its teaching staff. Is it, I wonder, like many businesses that overreach, overcomplicate, overpay and then underachieve? The answer, of course, is no, because it's gained nationally noted results without busting its budget. Tide Mill seems to have found sustainable success, and you can't knock that in any business. Do you feel that it's legitimate comparison to make between running a school, running a business? Should a school be run like a business? I think it has to be. Um, when I came, I came to school, to education with two years ago without having had any involvement at all in, in the education system. So I, I didn't know anything about right. being in a school. So I came into it from a business setting. So when I'm looking at, at the business, I'm thinking about how we should market it what that means, what extra revenue that brings in. So I do, I probably see it in a slightly different way to to most people who've been working in schools for sort of 10, 15 years. And that marketing is a, is a very real issue, isn't mm -hmm. it? Because you have got to sell to families to bring in pupils yeah. because those pupils bring in money. So it, yeah. it is like a business in that respect. It is, absolutely. And, and making sure that you're building those relationships with those parents so they stay with us. Now, if you were an ordinary company, I would say you're doing too many things. You should stick to your knitting. What you're about is educating kids, not about bringing in their parents, doing all sorts of uh, initiatives elsewhere. Why do you feel that's, that's not right? Well, I think uh, I, I've learned through, uh, you know, our successes here, the things we've tried and have failed or things we've tried and invested lots of effort and time in that have only made a minimum impact. We, we've discovered that the more we bring in parents, the more we involve parents, uh, the more we make them aware of what's going on in school, the more and better equipped they are to actually support children's learning at home. We, we work with children five and three quarter hours, six hours a day, 190 days a year. Parents with their children, you'd hope, most of the time. You know, we, 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 the, the impact we can make is significant, but it can be uh, exponential if we actually start involving parents too. As for the school staffing policy, it may pay more, but it doesn't cost more. Actually, if we look at comparable schools, we can benchmark against comparable schools in the in the London in a London area. Our costs are actually fairly similar. The reason for that is actually in a lot of schools, I think the average is something like 4.5 percent of budgets being spent on supply staff. We don't have to do that. Um, so actually, this year we're looking at, at not spending anything at all on supply really? staff. And if we were to, to look at, at that in, in terms of our budget, that would be, that's a saving of about £65,000. I have to say, I have changed my mind about things today, but having visited your school, and that I very much came this morning thinking that schools have got it wrong and that they shouldn't be doing all these extra projects, they should be concentrating on the classroom, getting their staff back in the classroom. But seeing how you've done it today, how you've marshalled your resources and actually how they've paid off and they've paid off in business terms doing all those extra things really has changed my mind about that. So, so thank you. I mean, thank you very much for that. It's been... Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, I want to visit another secondary school. At Preston Manor in Wembley, West London, there's also a huge emphasis on literacy and numeracy, but they've been doing it for 14 years. Over that time, Preston Manor has pulled itself up into the top 15% of best-performing schools in core subjects, despite all the problems associated with serving an unsettled inner-city community. 
Deputy Head Georgina Liveras arrived at the school 30 years ago as an English teacher. We've created an English department that's got 16, 17 members of staff and we've put more funding into the English department so that we can have intervention programmes that run from year 7 right through to year, year 11. The intervention programme works like this. There are eight mixed ability English classes in each year group plus two extra classes which bring together students at the same level. They spend around half a term with a specialist teacher and then return to their various other classes. The maths department also created two extra classes in each year, but kept streaming. We're able to create much smaller groups and individualise the learning for those children in maths. And how flexible are you in changing students from one set to the next during the school year? Uh, the maths department tends to do assessments um, two, three times a year and based on how well the children do and a discussion with the students, they're either moved up a set or they're taken down a set and then the, their progress is charted. They're more difficult to manage but effective? It's more difficult. You need an excellent timetabler and luckily we've got one. And um, you need to be able to listen to your heads of departments that are telling you that they want to deliver their curriculum in a particular way because it's to the benefit of the children. Teachers are also given more time out of the classroom to prepare and personalise the learning. Inclusion is just as big a priority. Um, where does comfort come from? It comes from police, um, um, bus drivers, football games. I'm gonna play you the school runs targeted programmes such as this one, run by the Black Boys Can Association. Where is the, those emotions? Where are those emotions? Huh? In your head? In your head? This is, I'm trying to find out where... In your heart. That's, that's, that's where I want us to go. Yeah? Your head or your heart, it comes from somewhere within. So I'm wondering how you are changing their attitude. Um, basically, it's just getting them to understand who they are. Um, although we call it Black Boys Can, they're much more than black. Um, they were made uniquely, wonderfully made, uniquely made, geniuses, distinctive in their own rights. So we bring out all that type of uh, learning, which is in them. They just have to recognise who they are and that they don't have to be like any other person. They need to find themselves. Preston Manor is a leading-edge school, which means it receives funding for trying out innovative programmes like this. All students can take their problems to a psychotherapist based in what was once the caretaker's house. So why should a school be paying for this in school time? Because surely this is the job of, of the social services and the schools here to educate, not, not sort out their social problems. I actually think that there's a growing recognition that there is an, a, a very large um, issue in relation to the emotional, uh, the impact of emotions on learning. And it's, you know, it's not every case is a, is a success story, but um, we've had feedback from the school time and again that behavior has improved, um, uh, school attendance in some cases has improved, and, um, and very often academic performance has, has improved. Preston Manor has been classed as a high-performing specialist school in science and maths and has become a mentor school to rattle other secondaries. Rattle, in this case, standing for raising achievement, transforming learning. It means, of course, that teachers can broaden their experience and the school can dip into more pots of specialised cash. The school is nearly underneath the archway, which brings in more cash from car parking every time there's a big match or event at Wembley. Should a school be um, run um, like a business? No, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm actually a business studies teacher and I've quite often drawn the parallel between the, the governance, for example, of schools and the way um, a board of directors might be set up. Um, but, you know, we are an organisation. We may be in the public sector, but our most important asset is our human resources. So those parallels are important. But one of the things I would say is we need to remind the industry that we don't have a uniform raw material that comes in in year seven. Every cohort is completely different. Now, I, I know that you've reduced the amount of teaching that teachers have to do in the classroom and therefore they're about, I don't know, nine, ten percent less productive. Now, from a business point of view, you'd say 
You're mad. By reducing the, the teaching time in terms of being in the classroom, you provide opportunities for staff to personalise the curriculum and to work with individual students and to make sure appropriate support is in place. So yes, less productive in terms of lessons taught, but I would say more productive in terms of the learning we're making sure goes on. Well, that was the third school I've visited over the past three days. And in that time, I've been trying to understand how schools can best use their resources. And the answer is, well, to treat the school like a business. These three schools that we've visited have one thing in common, and that is an approach to what's called individualised learning. And back at university, I remember being taught an economic principle called perfect pricing. And this was a, a theoretical concept in which the perfect business would charge each customer a different amount. So the customer who was really keen on your product would be charged the most, and the customer who was sort of lukewarm would be charged the least. And through that, you got the most profit because you got the most out of each individual customer. Now, you might think that schools aren't like businesses, but in fact, a lot of these schools are doing exactly that. They're not adopting one approach to all students. They have individualised it so that they're getting the most out of each pupil. And indeed, they're getting, as a result, the most out of the school because a lot of these schools have transformed their results. So these schools have managed to succeed by putting their resources into the hands of teachers. That's not been easy. It hasn't looked efficient, but because the results can be so dramatic, it has proved itself to be the most efficient model. So are schools like a business? Well, they're not like a simple one, they're like a complicated one, a very important business. And the story of these three schools has been a story of an enormous business success.